Let's begin by offering our respects to his confounder Acharya, his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. नमस्ते सरस्वते देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चात्य देशतारिणे हे कृष्ण करुण सिंधु दीन बंधु जगतपते गोपेश गोपिका कांत राधा कांत नमोस्तुते तप्त कंचन गौरंगी राधे वृंदावनेश्वरी वृषभानु सुते देवी प्रणमा हरि प्रिय वाचकल्पतरूव्यश्च कृपा सिंधु व्यव पति पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु नित्यानंद श्री अद्वैत गदाधार श्रीवासादि गौर भक्त वृंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे प्लीज रिपीट आफ्टर मी ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय 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 सो इन द प्रीवियस ओ आई एम सॉरी फर्स्ट लेट मी लेट मी सी हियर ओके वी वेलकम ऑल ऑफ यू टू आवर वीकली भगवदगीता क्लासेस we have with us here today aunty neeta deepthi adnani <clears throat> divya disha melwani durga prasad karuna jadwani lal <clears throat> i'm sorry lal and mahak melwani then we have manju nc venkatchari my parents are there ritu lalwani saket श्री हरि राधा देवी दासी वर्षा एंड वेंकटेश ओके सो इन द प्रीवियस क्लास वी फिनिश चैप्टर नंबर नाइन राइट चैप्टर नाइन इज टाइटल मोस्ट कॉन्फिडेंशियल नॉलेज एंड द चैप्टर एंडेड विद अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट इंस्ट्रक्शन बाय कृष्णा इट वाज द वर्स द लास्ट वर्स ऑफ द चैप्टर व्हिच डिवाइड्स द एंटायर गीता इनटू टू सेक्शंस इज इट we were discussing how the essence of all vedic knowledge is the bhagavad gita the essence of the bhagavad gita is in the middle six chapters the essence of the middle six chapters 
uh, are 9 and 10. And the essence of these middle six chapters is the last verse of chapter number 9. So who remembers what did Krishna say in the end of this chapter? Let me share my screen. See here, this is a very, very important verse. Actually, these two lines, Man Mana Bhava Mat Bhakto, Mat Yaji Maam Namaskaru, Krishna again repeats in the last uh, chapter. It's so important that he actually repeats this twice in the Bhagavad Gita. So what is uh, Krishna saying? He's saying, engage your mind always in thinking of me, become my devotee, offer obeisances unto me and worship me. Why does he want us to do all these things? Not because he likes to get worshipped, but because he wants our benefit. No, Because by doing this, by being completely absorbed in Krishna, surely you will come to me, Krishna says. So because Krishna wants his children back, no, just as how a loving father wants his children back home, like that Krishna is saying that you can come back to me by doing these four things. Hmm? So this is very, very important instruction. On this note, Krishna ends this chapter, which is the most confidential knowledge. Now we will go to the next chapter. Today we will begin uh, by the mercy of Guru and Krishna, chapter 10. It is titled The Opulence of the Absolute. Now, previously Krishna said that, um, see here, Let's go back. Krishna is saying, do this. No, Engage your mind always in thinking of me. Become my devotee. Offer obeisances unto me and worship me. Now, it is not possible for one to do all this. For example, if somebody just says that, you know, you must always engage your mind in thinking about me. Or somebody says, you have to become my devotee. You offer obeisances to me. You worship me. Then we, will, we need to have some attraction towards him to be able to uh, do this. Right? Otherwise, we will not be able to do it. And therefore, in order to enable us to do this, Krishna now in the next chapter is going to talk about his opulences. So here Krishna describes his opulences. In order to um, uh, facilitate that we are able to always think about him, worship him and uh, absorb our minds in him. Because when we, when we see the opulence of a person, then it attracts us. Mm -hmm. Opulence always attracts. For example, if we see somebody, if we see a luxurious car, uh, you know, somebody has just arrived in a big luxurious car, then immediately the curiosity is to see who is coming out of that car. You no, know, people will turn and see who is coming out of that car. So, like that, opulence is always going to attract. Now, Krishna has uh, all six opulences, as we have discussed before, in full quantity. You no, know? so of course, he is the most attractive personality because he has all six all six opulences and that too in the fullest extent nobody else can say that he has all six opulences in full does anybody remember when was the last time arjuna has spoken when was the last time arjuna spoke did he speak in chapter 9 No, no. The whole of chapter nine also is spoken exclusively by Krishna. As we discussed, Bhakti Yoga section is uh, very close to Krishna. Bhakti is very close to Krishna's heart. So you see here, without being prompted by Arjuna, um, Krishna has spoken the whole of chapter nine. Did he speak in chapter eight? Did Arjuna speak in chapter eight? Yes, Mataji. Yes, Mataji. And first two verses. Yes, very nice, Saket. So the first two verses, Arjuna has spoken, where he is inquiring about those technical terms that Krishna used at the end of chapter 7. Okay. So here, uh, apart from these two questions also, the whole of chapter 8 was also spoken by Krishna. Did Arjuna speak in chapter 7? No. No. Isn't it? So the whole of chapter 7 
the whole of chapter 8 except for the first two verses and the whole of chapter 9 also is spoken exclusively by krishna so this is krishna's ecstasy flowing from his heart now even 10th chapter begins without arjuna asking any questions so you will see here You will see this chapter also begins by uh, Krishna speaking without uh, being prompted by Arjuna uh, to explain anything. So Arjuna has no question. Krishna is speaking. But somewhere in the midst of the chapter, yes, Arjuna uh, speaks in this chapter. Does anybody have any question before we start today's chapter? Who can read today? Can I read Martha? Yes. Shri Radhe Hari. Thank you. I spoke, I spoke to my Guruji. He, he told me to put Radhe Hari. Okay. So that it would be then. Thank you. Oh, one second. Okay, so this chapter has a total of 42 verses. But before we begin the chapter, we need to see what is the benefit of reading, reciting, learning this particular chapter. So these are from the Gita Mahatmya, which is a conversation between Lord Shiva and Goddess Parvati. Lord Shiva is glorifying the Bhagavad Gita in 18 chapters. Because Bhagavad Gita has 18 chapters, Gita Mahatmya also has 18 chapters. So each verse of the Gita Mahatmya is glorifying uh, the corresponding chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. So Lord Shiva is saying that in a place called Kashi Puri, there was a Brahmana called Dhira Buddhi, who was very, very dear to Lord Shiva. And in fact, he is um, more dear or rather he's as dear to Lord Shiva as his vehicle uh, Nandi. So wherever Dira Buddhi would go, Lord Shiva would follow him so that he would protect him and serve him. Seeing this, Lord Shiva's eternal servant called Bringa Riddhi asked him one day, What is it that Dira Buddhi did that you are personally rendering service to him? So here the Lord Shiva is describing the story and he says that once in Kailash Parvat, in a garden called Punag, where Lord Shiva was sitting and enjoying moonlight. Everything was very, very peaceful, very serene. And suddenly there was a strong wind and trees began to shake because of the wind. And then he saw a huge shadow was covering the whole mountain. And it appeared as though the whole mountain was moving. Then Lord Shiva saw that a large giant bird has come, uh, is coming towards him. And this bird descends right in front of Lord Shiva and pays, pays respects to Lord Shiva and he starts to glorify Lord Shiva. And also offers a, he off, also offered him a lotus flower. Now this bird was actually a swan, but the swan was black in color. So Lord Shiva asks him that you are a swan and how come your color is black? So the swan starts to narrate a story. Now, this uh, this story, this Falashruti has many conversations within the conversations, right? So, we need to pay more attention. Now, the swan says that close to a place called Saurashtra. Saurashtra is modern day which city? Anybody knows? Saurashtra is modern day? I think it's Gujarat. Gujarat. Which city in Gujarat? Surat. Surat, yes. Correct. Okay. So the swan says, close to Saurashtra, there was a beautiful lake where there was a heavenly lotus. <clears throat> Originally, my color was white, like camphor. And I was enjoying in that place for some time. Then as I flew off from that place, I suddenly fell to the ground and my color became black. Then I heard a voice coming from the lake lotuses. So there are some lotuses in the lake. And he hears a voice from the lake lotuses and says, oh swan, get up. I will tell you why you fall down, why you fell down and why your color has 
uh, change to black. So then he says that I went to the center of the lake where there were five extraordinary lotuses. And from that one beautiful lady came out. So from the five lotuses, a beautiful lady has emerged. So the swan circumambulated and asked her for the reason for his condition. So now that lady who has come from the lotuses, she starts to speak. So she's saying, when you were flying, you flew over me. And because of that offense, because of the offense of going over me, you became black. So it's an offense actually to cross over. You no, know, If somebody is sitting or you have something important or books or whatever it is, we should not cross over. So that is an offense actually. So, so this lady is saying that because you flew over me, due to that offense, you have become black. As you are falling, I felt sorry for you. And so I called out to you. But when I opened my mouth, the scent emanating from it purified 7,000 black bees. And at one time, uh, at one time, and they attained heaven. So pretty powerful personality, you know, just by the scent emanating from her flower, 7,000 uh, black bees attain heaven. So now she says that I will tell you the reason for my power. So now this lady is saying that three births before this birth, I was born in a Brahmin family. So now this lady is narrating three births before her current birth. So she is saying that I was born in a Brahmin family and my name was Saroja Vadana. Her name is Saroja Vadana. And she says that I used to serve my husband with full faithfulness and sincerity. And one day she saw a mina and started to take care of it. Now, because she got attached to that maina and she used to take care of that maina, she got distracted from serving her husband. So, her husband cursed her to become a maina in her next life. So, next birth, she became a, a black maina. But because she was very chaste and she adhered to religious principles in the previous lifetime, therefore, this maina bird came in contact with sages who took her to their ashram. So one of the sage's daughters used to take care of this maina um, as though that is her uh, own. Uh, you know, she, she considered that maina to be very close to her. And she used to hear the recitation of the 10th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita twice daily. Or she, the, the daughter used to recite this 10th this chapter of the Bhagavad Gita twice daily. And therefore the maina is hearing. And therefore, in the next birth, she was born as an Apsara in Swarga. So she is now, because that Maina has heard the recitation of the Bhagavad Gita, she is now born as a Apsara in Swarga. And now her name is Padmavati. Now as an Apsara, Padma, Padmavati was once traveling over this lake and saw a beautiful lotus flower. And she was tempted to enjoy in the water. At that time, Durvasa Muni. So we know Durvasa Muni is known for his anger. No, He also appears in the Mahabharata. So Durvasa Muni was passing by the lake and, and uh, because uh, she was not appropriately dressed, therefore Durvasa Muni cursed her. Uh, cursed her and said that, cursed, one second. We cannot see the slide. You cannot see Falashruti? No. What are you able to see? Nothing. Only chapter 10 something which was there. Now? Now. Yes. Now, now you can I see. Can. Okay. Yeah, you can see the picture of Krishna's. Okay. Okay, so because of the curse of uh, Durvasa Muni, now uh, she has taken, Padmavati, the Apsara, has taken the form of five lotuses. So her two arms became two lotuses, her two legs became two lotuses, and the rest of the body became one lotus. So there are the five lotuses that we previously discussed. And Durvasa was angry and cursed that you will stay in this form for 100 years. Now, because she had heard the 10th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita in the previous life, she chanted it. No? She was chanting it even in the body of those five lotuses. And now 100 years have passed and her curse period has ended. But as she was getting released from the curse, that white swan flew over her and took that vibration and therefore fell down and became black. 
she says that you crossed over me so you are in this situation and i got released so she has got released from the curse but now that uh, the that bird who has crossed over has uh, is now in that situation so you see how she is not selfish she says uh, so she is explaining everything to him that why is why are you in this condition and she also says that if you hear from me this 10th chapter then you will also get released from this condition so she starts to recite chapter 10 and as soon as she does so a vaikuntha airplane arrives and takes padmavati back home back to godhead now the black swan takes the form of takes the lotus from that lake and then he comes and offers it to lord shiva so we started the story by saying how that bird has comes and offers obeisances to lord shiva and glorifies him right so this black swan takes a lake uh, takes the lotus from the lake and offers it to lord shiva and recites the story to him and immediately after reciting the story he gives he gives up his body after giving up his body he takes birth in a brahmana family and now his name is dheera buddhi who from childhood always chanted the 10th chapter so whoever heard that chanting from dheera buddhi whatever fallen a uh, condition he may be in however addicted he may be to bad qualities and however intoxicated he may be or even the killers of brahmanas they would all attain darshan of lord vishnu with shankha and chakra so it was so powerful to hear uh, the 10th chapter from the mouth of dheera buddhi that is why lord shiva is saying that oh bringaridi i am always serving dheera buddhi so what is the palashruti lord shiva is saying my dear parvati whether one be male or female sanyasi or grihastha in fact whatever situation one may be in if he chants the 10th chapter of shrimad bhagavad gita he will attain the darshan of lord vishnu okay what can you see now one second all right so this we already discussed you can see the screen right when was the last time arjuna spoke yes mata ji we can see the screen okay so this we have already discussed when was the last time arjuna spoke the first two verses of uh, chapter 8 so see except for the first two verses of chapter 8 krishna has spoken the whole of chapter 8 he continues to speak for the whole of chapter 9 and continues to speak without any interruption till the middle of chapter 10 krishna when he speaks about bhakti yoga speaks straight from the heart just lets out his emotions so what is the connection between chapter 9 and chapter 10 at the end of chapter 9 krishna describes pure devotional service and how he reciprocates with his devotees krishna concluded the chapter with his most confidential instruction man mana bhava mat bhakto engage your mind always in thinking of me become my devotee and imperative to fix the mind on krishna therefore in chapter 10 krishna further describes his opulences potencies and position which will enhance one's attraction for him thus helping him to fix his mind and remember him while seeing opulent powerful and beautiful things in this world so conclusion of chapter 9 is that one should become a pure devotee of the lord chapter 10 will increase our devotion by hearing more about krishna's opulences so at the to summarize at the end of chapter 9 what did krishna establish as the goal of life who can answer become his devotee yes become his devotee or have pure devotion to him very nice live happily in the material world and become his devotee okay what will he describe in chapter 
His opulence is to increase attraction towards him. Exactly. His opulence is potencies and position. And why will he describe? Varsha already answered to enhance our attraction to him. Now, how does knowing Krishna's opulence increase one's attraction or devotion? We have already discussed this today. It increases our love to him. Yes. When a devotee understands Krishna's greatness in detail, he feels increased gratitude for his good fortune of being able to reciprocate intimately with such a great and powerful Lord. So yes, the love factor. And what are the six opulences? Beauty, fame, fame, wealth, wealth, beauty, renunciation. Yes, very strength nice. And intelligence. Yes, excellent. So beauty, fame, wealth, intelligence, strength and renunciation. These are the six opulences and Krishna has all six in full quantities. Okay. Now some nobody can say that I am the most beautiful but and I am also the most famous. I am also the richest person. And I'm also the most intelligent person and the most powerful person and I'm the most renounced person. One person cannot have all these six qualities and certainly cannot have it in full quantity. Somebody may be the richest man on, on earth, maybe. But he's not also the most famous and the most intelligent, the most powerful and the most renounced. That's not possible. Mm -hmm. So God is that personality who has all six opulences in full. So therefore, he is the most attractive personality. So what are the two major aspects to increase our attraction for one person? One is opulence. What is the other aspect? Sweetness. Sweetness. Yes, we have discussed before. No. So in chapter 9, Krishna reveals both aspects. He, he reveals both opulence as well as sweetness. So this chapter is divided into four sections. As we proceed, we will see them. So section 1, 1 to 7, understanding Krishna's unknowability one serves him. So Krishna is unknowable, but still we try to understand. So let's go through the shlokas. One second. Shri Bhagavan Vacha Bhūya eva mahābāho Shrunu me paramam vachaha Yatya ham priya mānāya Vakshyāmi hita kāmyaya The Supreme Personality of God had said, Listen again, O mighty armed Arjun, because you are my dear friend, for your benefit I shall speak to you further. Giving knowledge that is better than what I have already explained, Hare Krishna. So remember, we are still in the middle of the bhakti section. And what is Krishna saying here? He's saying, listen again, O mighty Amdarjuna, O Mahabaho. Why does he want Arjuna to listen? Because you are my dear friend. Friend means that person who is not envious, who is who is someone who is happy with your success. So because Arjuna is not envious of God, he's not envious of the position of God because he's happy being the servant of God. So Krishna, so Krishna is saying, because you have this qualification of being my dear friend, therefore, I will speak to you. What is Krishna going to speak? Further, giving knowledge that is better than what I have already explained. So Krishna has just explained what the most confidential knowledge. Now he is going to give him knowledge that is better than what he has already explained. So he is going to give him something better than the most confidential knowledge. Why is Krishna going to do that? For Arjuna's benefit. Hmm? Because see here, Krishna, Krishna is saying, for your own benefit, I shall speak to you for the So for the benefit of Arjuna, and Arjuna is representing us, no, the living entities. So for the benefit of us, the living entities, Krishna is going to give knowledge that is better than the most confidential knowledge. So most confidential knowledge we see saw in the previous um, chapter, 
Krishna is describing Raja Vidya. No, Krishna said that this is Raja Vidya, Raja Guhyam. Raja Vidya means the king of all knowledge. Higher than the king is the emperor. So here Krishna is going to speak better than what he has already spoken. What is the qualification for one to receive this? That one should be non-envious. One should be a friend of God. And why is Krishna saying? For our own benefit, for the benefit of Arjuna. So how does one receive this knowledge? By hearing. Because see, Krishna is saying, listen again. So the whole... Um, the whole thing to understand here is that we should hear. We should hear Vedic knowledge. No, it's this this knowledge is coming, and we have to hear attentively in disciplic succession. So hearing is very very important. Let's go to next verse. Namme vedo sura gana ha, prabhavam namaharshaya ha, ahamadirhi devanam. Neither the host of demigods nor the great sages known by my original origin or opulences, for in every respect I am the source of the demigods and sages. So Krishna is saying that even the devatas, the demigods, nor the great sages, no, see here. Krishna is using the word Suragana. Sura. Sura is opposite of Asura. Asura are the demons and Suras are the devatas, the demigods. So neither the Suragana nor neither the devatas nor the Maharishaya nor the Maharishis nor the great sages know about the origin and opulences of Krishna. So it's impossible to understand Krishna in full. Why? For in every respect, I am the source of the demigods and the sages. Why we, Why they do not know is because Krishna is the source of the demigods and the sages. See, usually if there is a father and son, the father knows more about the son than the son knows about the father. So here, fa Krishna is the source of all these demigods and sages. So Krishna is the supreme father. Therefore, Krishna knows the demigods and the sages, but it's not vice versa. No? The devatas and the sages, they do not know uh, the great, um, uh, the op they do not know the opulences and the origin of Krishna, Krishna is saying. So what is, um, what is a qualification for one to be able to understand Krishna's opulences and origin? You have, to be a power? you have to be non-envious and you have to be a devotee. Uh -huh. You have to be non-envious and you have to be a devotee. Mm -hmm. So one cannot understand the Lord by power or um, uh, wealth. Because if you see the both the um, devatas and the great sages, they are, they are very powerful. They have very uh, great powers. But still Krishna is saying that they cannot understand. They are also very, very intelligent. One may be materially very, very intelligent. No, one may one may be a great pandit, great scholar. But even intelligence is not a requirement to understand Krishna. Because again, devatas and the great rishis, they are very intelligent people. They're very intelligent. But even then Krishna is saying that they do not know my origin and opulences. So we can know uh, Krishna only by the mercy of Krishna. Krishna should sanction. Uh, he should allow us to understand. That's why many people can purchase a Bhagavad Gita across the counter and even read it. But how many people can actually understand it? You can understand only when Krishna wants to reveal the knowledge to you. And when will Krishna reveal the knowledge to you? When one surrenders to Krishna. The more we surrender in proportion, Krishna is going to give his mercy. Let's see three. Yoma Majamana Dimcha Veti Loka Maheshwaram Asam Udha Samartyeshu Sarva Papai Pramuchyate He who knows me as the unborn, as the beginningless, as the supreme lord of all the worlds, he only undiluted among men is freed from all sins. Hare Krishna. So he who knows me as unborn, he who knows Krishna as ajam. Unborn means Krishna, Krishna has not come uh, from somebody else. No, Krishna is the origin of everybody else. So therefore Krishna is saying that he is unborn. Uh, 
So one who knows Krishna is Ajam and Anadim. Anadim means beginningless. There is no beginning and there is no end to Krishna. He is unlimited. He is Ananta. So there never was a time when the Lord did not exist. There never was a time when Krishna did not exist. And as a supreme Lord of all the worlds, Veti Loka Maheshwaram. So one who understands Krishna is Ajam, Anadim and Veti Loka Maheshwaram. Then that person is Asamudha. He is undiluted. Mm -hmm. And he is Sarva Papa Pramuchyate. He is freed from all the sins. This is the reason why Krishna wants to reveal his opulences to us. So that we can be undiluted. Mm -hmm. And we can be freed from all sinful reactions. See sometimes even Lord Brahma is referred to as Ajam. But he is definitely not Anadim. And he's definitely not Vedati Loka Maheshwaram. Because we know that Lord Brahma's duration, he lives for 100 of his years. And then his um, uh, his existence comes to an end. No, He ceases to be Lord Brahma. Because Brahma is a post. And then somebody else is appointed in, the, in that post. So, yes, Brahma is sometimes referred to as Ajam. But he's definitely not Anadim. And definitely not Vedati Loka Maheshwaram. Now one may say that, but Krishna is the son of Devaki and Vasudev. He was born in that in that jail of Kamsa. How can he be unborn? So the answer to this is, he appeared before Devaki and Vasudev in his original form. If you read the Krishna book and also the 10th cant of the Srimad Bhagavatam, you will see how when Krishna appeared, he appeared in his original form. Here you can see. Not as an ordinary child and then transformed into an ordinary child. Here you can see how he then transformed into an ordinary child. Let's go to the next two verses. Buddhir jnana masam moha Kshama satyam dama Sukham dukham bhavo bhavo Bhayam cha bhayam eva cha Ahimsa samata tushti tapodanam yasho yashaha bhavanti bhava bhutanam mattayeva prithag vidhaha Intelligence, knowledge, freedom from doubt and delusion, forgiveness, truthfulness, control of the senses, control of the mind, happiness and distress, death, birth, fear, fearlessness. Non-violence, equanimity, satisfaction, astuity, charity, fame, and infamy, all these various qualities of living beings are created by me alone. So Krishna has not only created uh, the great sages and the demigods and all the living entities, even here Krishna is saying that even the various qualities of the living entities are created by me alone. So here he is... Um, Discussing various qualities of the living entities. We can see these here in the next slide. So what are the qualities Krishna is mentioning in these two verses? First he says intelligence, buddhi. So buddhi, what is it? The power to analyze things in their pros proper perspective. Which means to see what is it that is good for me and what is it that is bad for me. To reject the bad and to accept the good. So what is it that is going to do me ultimate good is those things that will take me closer to Krishna. Those things that will enable me to go back home, back to Godhead. So intelligence means to choose that which is favorable for my Krishna consciousness and reject that which is not favorable for my Krishna consciousness. So intelligence is the uh, first quality that Krishna mentions. Then he says knowledge, jnanam. What is jnanam? Knowing the distinction between the matter and spirit. So first, first lesson of spiritual life is to know the difference between matter and spirit. To know that I am spirit soul. No, I, I have a material body, but I am spirit soul. That's the reason why I don't want to die. I don't want to grow old. I don't want to have any disease. That's the reason. Because the spirit is uh, does not grow old or die or uh, get any disease. So, Jnanam is to know the distinction between matter and spirit. And unfortunately, Srila Prabhupada writes in the pulpit that the modern university education talks only about matter. It does not talk about spirit soul. Therefore, the knowledge is incomplete. So, how many years we spend studying? So many years, no, over a decade. But we never are taught that you are not the body 
you are the soul. Mm -hmm. Then three, freedom from doubt and delusion, asamoha. Slowly but surely, one becomes free from bewilderment when one acts without hesitation based on understanding transcendental philosophy. Nothing should be accepted blindly, but with care and caution. So, Asamoha means to be free from bewilderment. So, of course, this knowledge we can get by reading the Shastra, by reading what Krishna says, hearing from bona fide sources. One does not have to accept blindly. You can you can uh, cross-check. No, There are three lines of authority, Guru, Sadhu and Shastra. So, yes, we accept from authorities with care and caution. Tolerance and forgiveness, Shama, excuse the minor offenses of others. So this is this tolerance we see as the Kali Yuga is increasing, the tolerance level is decreasing. Now people don't want to tolerate even the minor offense of us. Somebody slaps you, immediately you want to take an extreme step. No? So excuse the minor. Nowadays we have road rage. So many people are killed just in a road rage. Something happens on the road on the spot and you take the gun and they're shooting people. No, So road rage. So this is what uh, people don't have any tolerance and forgiveness. It should be practiced. What should be practiced? To bear insult and dishonor from others. Doesn't matter if others insult you. Doesn't matter if others dishonor you. What matters at the end of the day is what Krishna thinks about you. We don't want to please the whole world. We, it only matters whether Krishna is pleased with us or no. That's the only thing that matters. What is the use if the whole world glorifies you, but Krishna, um, but you're not receiving Krishna's mercy? And what is what what does it matter? I mean, if Krishna is giving you mercy, what does it matter if the whole world is dishonoring you? It's not important. Then truthfulness, satyam, facts presented as they are for the benefit of others, not distorting truth for some personal interest. So yes, it is important to speak the truth for the benefit of others, for the benefit of others. So truth, one must use a um, little bit of intelligence. No, Yes, one must always be truthful. But I was hearing in a lecture of one situation where one man was um, being followed and some decoys wanted to kill him. So he was running for his life and then he enters into the house of another person and he tells the person that, you know, these people want to kill me. Please don't tell them that I'm here. Now the decoys were following him and then they see him on the way and they ask him, did you see this man, this particular man? So he said, I, he thought that I don't want to lie. I want to speak the truth. So he says, yes, he just entered my house. And then they enter him and they kill him. <laughs> so, so there perhaps, you know, obviously to save the life, he could have spoken an untruth. So facts should be presented as they are for the benefit of others. Don't distort the truth for some personal interest. For your own personal interest, then of course the truth should not be distorted. Social convention to speak palatable, but it is not always good. So yes, social convention is to speak in a way that the the person likes what you speak, but it is not always good for you. It's important to call a thief a thief. That time, yes, we have to speak the truth. But we must understand that, yes, truth is bitter, but it does not have to be said in a bitter way. You can say it in such a way that you don't offend the person. At the same time, you are speaking the truth. Control of the senses, Dhamma. Senses should not be used for unnecessary personal enjoyment so dhamma is control of the senses use the control in the service of the lord not for your own personal enjoyment because remember we cannot independent we cannot enjoy independent of krishna we can enjoy with him in the spiritual world but independent of him we cannot enjoy so therefore senses should not be used for personal uh, enjoyment then after dhamma after control of the senses comes control of the mind sama so restrain the mind from unnecessary thoughts. What is the misuse of the thinking power to spend one's time pondering over money? So sometimes one is always thinking, how can I make more money? What can I do that I can get an extra income? No, always absorbed. If one is always absorbed in uh, thinking about how I can make more money, then yes, you are um, spending your mind in unnecessary thoughts. Yes, of course, one needs to have a certain income in order to give, um, to have a, 
have a comfortable life for yourself and your family but don't make it your number one priority it should not be the most prominent thing on your mind of course we need to uh, understand see intelligence means to prioritize how are we going to prioritize what is what should be the number one thought in my mind because what is the number one thought in my mind during my lifetime is what is going to come to me at the time of death and what is my last thought the time of death is going to determine my destination whether i'm going to get animal body or another human body or am i going to go to the heavenly planets or am i going to go to the uh, spiritual world so it's very very crucial power, power of thought should be used to understand the prime necessity of human beings and to present authoritatively so yes we have to understand what is the prime necessity of human beings to be able to go back home back to god to develop love of krishna and that has to also be presented authoritatively pass it down to others in an authoritative way without altering the message power of thought should be developed in association with guru sadhu and shastra so in association of guru sadhu and shastra only we can um, develop the power of thought so see first we saw dhamma control of senses and then we saw sama control of mind which of the two is more important which is the, which of the two is crucial and can automatically lead to the other i think the senses is more important when you control the senses then you can control the mind and intelligence okay anybody else wants to try i mean vice versa too vice versa too but you have to choose one <laughs> okay then the senses or it's a mind i think so Yes, the mind. When you control exactly, when you control the mind, automatically you can control the other senses. No, the the mind is the center of all the senses. So if the mind is controlled, automatically you can control all the senses. Yes, very nice. Next, happiness and distress, sukham and dukham. See, so far Krishna has been talking about the positive qualities: intelligence, knowledge, freedom from uh, illusion. and here krishna is going to talk about the dualities no good and bad so that's why he is saying sukha and dukha bhava and abhava so now he is talking about the dualities if you see the shloka the first two lines of shloka 4 are the positive qualities and the next two lines of shloka 4 are the dualities krishna is talking about dualities so happiness and distress sukha and dukha always consider in relation to what is favorable or unfavorable to krishna consciousness anything that is favorable to your krishna consciousness is going to give you happiness obviously because it's going to take develop you help you develop love of god and whatever is unfavorable to krishna consciousness is going to give you distress because it is going to keep you in the material world and material world is dukhalayam ashashvatam no anityam asukham lokam we have seen this in the previous classes birth and death bhava and abhava for soul there is no birth or death should be understood to refer to the body so the birth and death happens only for the body but the for the soul there is no birth and death then fear and fearlessness bhaya and abhayam fear is due to worrying about the future we worry too much what will happen to our children what will be the future of our children what will happen to uh my finances in the future or health we are worried about the health in the future we are worried if somebody robs me in the future i'm going to go here what is... so we are always worried about our future so fear is due to worrying about the future fear is caused by our absorption in the illusory energy when we are absorbed in maya then there is fear fearlessness is possible only in krishna consciousness the more krishna conscious one is the more fearless one is classic example is prahlad no prahlad was fully krishna conscious he had full faith in the lord so even though he was attacked by weapons he was kept in the dark room he was uh, there were snakes which were sent to him in the dark room he was thrown from a cliff he was they 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 tied rock to him and they tried to drown him in the water they brought big big elephants to trample him um, under the elephant's feet and just 5 year old no such a tender 5 year old prahlad he has a tender 5 year old body but he was completely fearless so fearless is possible only in krishna consciousness one is confident of his spiritual identity engages in transcendental services surety of his bright future that he is going back home back to god so a devotee does not fear even death because a devotee knows that death means that now i am going to go back home back to god so for a devotee there is no fear of death 
non violence ahimsa not to do anything which would put others in misery confusion or distress so this is the real meaning of ahimsa don't do anything which will put others in misery or confusion or distress hmm? that which generate that which furthers the future spiritual happiness of the people in general is called non violence so anything that you can do which will help the people to advance in their spiritual life that is non violence that is real ahimsa because that is the way that you can help the other people benefit one can go to an old age home orphanage or um, a hospital and render free treatment and render give uh, free food clothes whatever it is but it is not going to benefit them because all that is only for the body that that benefit they can enjoy only till they are alive in that particular lifetime but after that what's going to happen again they are going to be cats and dogs if they are not going to be devotees again they are going to be born as cats and dogs so what is the use hmm? so if you can help them increase their spiritual uh, knowledge then that is ahimsa because that will benefit them eternally equanimity samant samata freedom from attachment or aversion that means you should not be attached neither should you be hating anything that is favorable or unfavorable for you accept the material world without attachment or aversion a devotee has nothing to reject and nothing to accept save in terms of its usefulness in the prosecution of krishna consciousness so anything that is useful for your krishna consciousness only there is to accept anything that is not good for your krishna consciousness a devotee has to reject other than that there is nothing else for a devotee to accept or reject he is equal in all circumstances no he is he is free from attachment or aversion satisfaction tushti not to be eager to gather more and more material things by unnecessary activities one should be satisfied with what one has received one should be satisfied with what is obtained by the grace of the lord austerity and penance tapas voluntary accepting hardships or suffering for a higher purpose example rising early and taking a bath fasting on recommended days so one is uh voluntarily accepting some hardships for one's spiritual advancement so that is tapasya austerity and penance for example who is forcing a devotee to fast on ekadashi or do a, a janmashtami fast till 12 midnight no but a devotee voluntarily accepts it for one's own for a higher purpose which is for one's spiritual advancement charity danam give 50% of income to krishna consciousness and to whom the income should be to whom the charity should be given to brahmanas and sanyasis see when we when we donate or when we do any kind of social service it's very important to whom you are giving and shastras recommend that you should give to brahmanas and sanyasis or devotees of the lord if you are going to give some charity to a meat eater or to a drug addict for example he is going to use that charity for for sinful activities no to eat more meat or to consume more drugs so then you have to you have to partake the karmic reaction of that if you donate and that donation is used for sinful activity then you have to share the karmic reaction of that because you have sponsored it so therefore charity one must give charity also with intelligence to people who are not going to misuse the charity to people who are going to use that charity in the service of the lord this 50% income we will discuss in the future slides then fame a man is famous when he is known as a great devotee this is the real fame because that is what is going to put you under the direct protection of krishna so if somebody is a great pop star or one is a film star and is famous but what is the use of that fame again if he is going to be become a cat or dog in the next lifetime so real fame is when one is a great devotee see previously um the heroes of the people were those people who were um, or the who had great moral values you know but nowadays uh, the role models of people are the pop stars the film stars these have become the role models of the society and then these film stars are actually advertising cigarettes alcohol and uh, pan parag and so many things so it's a very uh, sorry situation and therefore the people are the youth especially they are following them and then they are getting misled into bad activities but previously role models were actually great devotees great sages who had high moral values and then such um, such great people were followed 
Okay, now coming to uh, talk about this 50% of income to Krishna consciousness. Now here, Srila Prabhupada is referring to the example of Srila Rupa Goswami when he retired from government service. So Rupa Goswami and Sanatan Goswami were the direct disciples of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And be but before they became uh, stalwart Vaishnavas, they were serving in the in um, serving in the Muslim government. At that time, India was under the Islamic rule. So see, Lord Chaitanya met the two brothers, Dabira Khasa and Shakara Malik. So they had changed their names at that time in a village known as Rama Keli in the district of Malda. And after that meeting, the brothers decided to retire from government service and join Lord Chaitanya. Dabira Khasa, who was later to become Rupa Goswami, retired from his post and collected all the money he had accumulated during his service. It is described in the Chaitanya Charitamrita that his accumulated savings in gold coins equaled millions of dollars and filled a large boat. So imagine how much money he has accumulated, enough to fill a large boat. He divided the money in an exemplary manner, which should be followed by devotees in particular and by humanity in general. So how did he divide his money? 50% of his accumulated wealth was distributed to Krishna conscious persons. Namely, the Brahmanas and the Vaishnavas. 25% was distributed to relatives and 25% was kept against emergency expenditures and personal difficulties. Later on, when Shakara Malik also proposed to retire, the Nawab was very much agitated and put him into jail. But Shakara Malik, who was later to become Srila Sanatan Goswami, took advantage of his brother's personal money, which had been deposited with a village banker, and escape from the prison of Hussein Shah. In this way, both brothers joined Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So this is there in your necro of uh, devotion preface. So this is how the wealth was divided. So that this is where Prabhupada is referring to hmm, when he says 50% of income to Krishna consciousness. Okay, so then Srila Prabhupada concludes in the purport of whatever we find, good or bad, the origin is Krishna. So all the qualities, whether it is good quality or bad quality, the origin is Krishna. Nothing can manifest itself in this material world which is not in Krishna. That is knowledge. Although we know that things are differently situated, we should realize that everything flows from Krishna. So nothing can exist independent from Krishna. That is the bottom line. So one may say, oh, if the bad also is coming from Krishna, if I have some bad qualities, then what's the problem with that is also coming from Krishna. So how to understand this? So this is how we understand. The sun does not create shadows, but if a person turns his face away from the sun, then he experiences the shadow. So how does the shadow come from the sun? So does the shadow come from the sun? Indirectly, yes. Directly, no. The sun does not send out shadows. But if the sun does not exist, there would be no shadows also. Similarly, even the dualities cannot function in this world without Krishna. Specifically, it is coming to us because of our own karmic reactions. But nothing is outside the jurisdiction of Krishna. Hmm? So, it's pretty clear this analogy. This is how we understand. Let's go to six. Maharshaya Sapta Purve Chatwaro Manavastata Madhava Manasajata Yesham Loka Imatraja. The seven great sages and before them, before other great sages in the Manus progenitors of mankind come from me, born from my mind and all the living beings populating the various planets descend from me. So the seven great sages, who are the seven great sages? We know them as the Sapta Rishis. No? You may have heard of the term Sapta Rishi. So the seven great sages and before the seven great sages, before the Sapta Rishis are the four other great sages. Who are these four other great sages? Who can say? The four sons of Lord Brahma. The four Kumaras. The four Kumaras. The four Kumaras. Yes. Okay. The four Kumaras. So the Sapta Rishis and the four Kumaras and the Manus. Who are the Manus? 
the word manushya or man actually comes from this name manu so the there are 14 manus in one day of brahma 14 manus in one day of brahma mm. so what is krishna saying that these saptarishis the four great sages the four kumaras and the manus they all come from me they all come from me born from my mind and all the living beings populating the various planets descend from them so all of us all these living entities all the living entities who are on the planet are descending from these these personalities the seven great sages the four kumaras and the manus come from me born from my mind born from my mind how come hmm? so let's try to understand so first of all the sapta rishis now the sapta rishis are the first manu are described in <clears throat> this particular verse from the shrimad bhagavatam <clears throat> and then the saptarishis of the current manu are described in this particular verse so as we discussed there are 14 manus and the current manu is different from the first manu so the in our manu these are the saptarishis so it changes hmm? then the four kumaras are sanak sanatan sanandana and sanat kumar these are the uh, four sons of lord brahma and then as we discussed the 14 manus, there are 14 manus in the day of Brahma. So there are 14 manus in one day of Brahma in a year. Therefore, there are 5,040 manus. Brahma has to live for 100 years. Consequently, the total of manus appearing and disappearing during the life of Brahma is 504,000. This is the calculation for one universe, that is our universe. And there are innumerable universes. All these manus come and go simply by the breathing process of maha vishnu so these are the 14 manus so the first manu is called as the swayambhuva manu who is the current manu who is the manu in our current time devash vasvavata no seventh ah vaivashvata vaivashvata is that what you said i'm sorry i, I didn't hear properly okay. so vaivashvata manu is the current manu Okay. Now, when Brahma, when Lord Brahma had appeared from that lotus, from the navel of um, Garbhodakashai Vishnu, he didn't know the purpose of his existence. No, who is he? Why has he come into existence? What is the service that he is supposed to do? So he he didn't know. So he did tapasya in order to understand, and his tapasya lasted for 1,000 demigod years, 1,000 years of the Devadas. And then by the mercy of Krishna, he understood that his role, his service is to create. So therefore, he brought into existence the Parajapatis, or they are called as the patriarchs of the living entities, the 25 great sages. Who are these 25 great sages? The Saptarishi 7 plus 4, the 4 Kumaras and the 14 Manus. Total will give you 25. So they are called as a prajapatis or the patriarchs of the living entities. Therefore, Brahma is called as a pitamaha, grandfather, because from these prajapatis, all the living entities have come into existence. So therefore, Brahma is called as a pitamaha or the grandfather. And Krishna is called as a pra-pitamaha. He is the father of the grandfather. Because it's from Krishna's expansion only that Brahma has come into existence. So we know that Krishna's first expansion in the material world is Mahavishnu. From Mahavishnu comes Garboda Kashai Vishnu and from the navel of Garboda Kashai Vishnu comes Lord Brahma. So see here in these verses you can um, see what had actually happened. I will read. In the beginning Brahma created four great sages, Sanaka, Sanandana, Sanatana and Sanat Kumar. All of them were unwilling to adopt material activities because they were highly elevated due to their semen flowing upwards. So they refused to uh, procreate. On the refusal of the sons to obey the order of their father, there was much anger generated in the mind of Brahma, which he tried to control and not express. Although he tried to curb his anger, it came out from between his eyebrows and a child mixed blue and red was immediately generated. After his birth, he began to cry, O oh, destiny maker, teacher of the universe, kindly designate my name and place. Anybody can say who was this personality? Rudra. Rudra, yes, very nice. 
So let's see what happens next. After Brahma said, O chief of the demigods, you, should, you shall be called by the name Rudra by all people because you have so anxiously cried. Lord Brahma said, my dear boy Rudra, you have 11 other names. So these are the 11 names. O Rudra, you shall always have, you shall all, you also will have 11 wives called the Rudranis and they are as followers. So you have the names of the 11 Rudranis. My dear boy, you may now accept all the names and places designated for you and your different wives. And since you are now one of the masters of the living entities, you can increase the population on a large scale. So see, first Brahma created the four Kumaras to increase the population because his uh, his service is to create. But then the four Kumaras refused to do so. And then he has created Rudra uh, and there are 11 Rudras and there are 11 Rudranis. And he's telling them that now you can increase the population on a large scale. Yeah, Sri Radhe Hari, you have a question? This thing you're saying that um, uh, Rudra was created through Brahma's anger. Um, so th does that mean that um, Brahma's brain or mind is controlled by uh, Krishna or Vishnu? Because he was created by Vishnu. So when he creates um, people like Rudra through the anger and everything, is his mind cre is worked by uh, Tamogun or Rajogun or by Krishna himself? No, no, Lord Brahma is always in the mode of goodness. You cannot say that Lord Brahma is in the mode of passion or ignorance. Lord Brahma is in charge of the mode of passion. This is how we understand. Because he's in charge of the mode of passion, he controls the mode of passion in this material world, in this, in this material universe. Therefore, Srila Prabhupada explains that sometimes because they are in charge of that particular mode, sometimes they can get influenced by that particular mode. But largely, Lord Brahma is definitely in the mode of goodness. Okay. So when he creates like this Rudra, then mean he's he's uh, creating because he's in mode of goodness and Krishna so desire that Rudra should be created and so it's done. Yeah, everything happens because of Krishna's desire. There's nothing that can happen independent of Krishna. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, then what happens next? The mo Now Krish uh, Lord Shiva wants um, Rudra, these 11 Rudras and Rudranis to increase the population on a large scale. Now what happens? The most powerful Rudra, whose bodily color was blue mixed with red, created many offspring exactly resembling him in features, strength and furious nature. The sons and grandsons generated by Rudra were unlimited in number and when they assembled together, they attempted to devour the entire universe. When Brahma, the father of the living entity, saw this, he became afraid of the situation. Brahma told Rudra, O oh best among the demigods, there is no need for you to generate living entities of this nature. They have begun to devastate everything on all sides with the fiery flames from their eyes and they have even attacked me. My dear son, you had better situate yourself in penance, which is auspicious for all living entities and which will bring all benediction upon you. By penance, by penance only shall you be able to create the universe as it was before. So here, Lord Brahma is telling Rudra that you have to go into penance, go into tapasya. Then what happens next? Sri Maitreya said, Thus Rudra, having been ordered by Brahma, circumambulated his father, the master of the Vedas. Addressing him with words of ascent, he entered the forest to perform austere penances. So, Rudra has gone to do his penance. Meanwhile, what has happened? Brahma, who was empowered by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, thought of generating living entities and begot ten sons for the extension of the generation. So now Brahma has begotten ten sons. Who are they? Marichi, Atri, Angira, Pulatsya, Pulaha, Kratu, Brigu, Vashishta, Daksha and the ten son Narada were thus born. Now Narada was born from the deliberation of Brahma which is the best part of the body. So he is the mind born son. Narada is the mind born son of Brahma. Vashishta was born from his breathing, Daksha from the thumb, Rigu from his touch and Kritu from his hand. Pulatsya was generated from the ears, Angira from the mouth, Atri from the eyes, Marichi from the mind and Pulaha from the navel of Brahma. Sage Kardama or Kardama Muni, we know, no? Kardama Muni, husband of great Devahuti, was manifested from the shadow of Brahma. Thus all became manifested from either the body or the mind of Brahma. So these are the ten sons of Brahma. Now, what happens next? O son of the Kurus, when Brahma saw that in spite of the presence of sages of great potency, 
there was no sufficient increase in population. So even, even after these 10 sages, there is no sufficient increase in population. He began to seriously consider how the population could be increased. Brahma thought to himself, alas, it is wonderful that in spite of my being scattered all over, there is still insufficient population throughout the universe. There is no other cause for this misfortune but destiny. Lavina, you have your hand raised? Yeah, actually, when you said that uh, Bra Narada is the son of Bra Brahma, but how come he is the maid servant once you said? No, that is the previous life. That maid okay. servant, Narada, that is his previous lifetime. This yes. is the current lifetime. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. While he was thus absorbed in contemplation and was observing the supernatural power, two other forms were generated from his body. They are still celebrated as the body of Brahma. Now, after creating those dead cells and there is no sufficient increase in population, now he has created two personalities. These two newly separated bodies unite, united together in a sexual relationship. Out of them, the one who had the male form came to be known as Manu named Swayambhuva. So, Swayambhuva Manu is the first of the 14 Manus, remember? And the woman became known as Shatarupa, the queen of the great soul, Manu. So, Manu and Shatarupa. Thereafter, by sex indulgence, they gradually increase generations of population one after another. O son of Bharata, in due course of time, he, who, Manu, begot in Shatarupa five children, two sons, Priyavrata and Uttanpad, and three daughters, Akuti, Devahuti and Prasuti. So, who is Uttanpad? Anybody knows? More famous personality. He's the king. He's the, he was the father of Prahlad. He is the father of Prahlad. Yes, very nice. So, Prahlad is actually the great grandson of Lord Brahma himself because Brahma's son is Manu. Manu's mm -hmm. son is Uttanpad, and Uttanpad's son is um, Dhruv. Okay. Then the father Manu handed over his first daughter Akuti to the sage Ruchi, the middle daughter Devahuti to the sage Kardama and the youngest Prasuti to Daksha. From them all the world filled with population. So this is how finally Lord Brahma was able to populate the universe. Anyway, to summarize generations that came from Lord Brahma, first there were four Kumaras. They refused to procreate. Then came Rudra and then Rudra was sent for um, uh, doing tapasya and then 10 sons were generated. And then we have Kardama Muni. Out of these 10 sons was Kardama who, who was manifested from the shadow of Lord Brahma. And then we have Swayambhuva, Manu and Shatarupa. Two other forms who were generated from the body of Lord Brahma. So remember the word Manushya or man actually comes from Manu. Okay, the last shloka for the day. Etam vibhutim yogam cha mama yoveti tatvataha so vikalpena yogena yujyate natra samshayaha One who is factually convinced of this opulence and mystic power of mind engages in unalloyed devotional service of this. There is no doubt, Hare Krishna. So now Krishna has described his opulence, no? how everything has come from him. So what is Krishna saying? When you are actually convinced of this opulence and mystic power of mind, Krishna says, then you will engage in unalloyed devotional service. You will engage in unalloyed means pure uh, devotional service. See, a vikalpena yogena. That yogena, that devotional service is without any division, without any deviation, without any distraction. So that means it is unalloyed devotional service. So this is the reason why Krishna is revealing his opulence. So that we can engage in unalloyed devotional service. And of this there is no doubt. Why there is no doubt? Why there is surety that yes, by hearing of the opulence of Krishna, we will engage in unalloyed devotional service because there is nothing more to be known beyond Krishna. There is nothing beyond Krishna. So when we can understand the opulence and mystic power of Krishna, then obviously the it's only natural that one engages in an unalloyed devotional service. See, Lord Krishna loves you more in a moment than anyone could ever love you in an entire lifetime. So because Krishna loves us, Therefore, he's revealing his opulences. It's not that Krishna is revealing opulences because he wants to show off. 
no it is for our own benefit because he loves us only he is actually sharing his opulences now does it mean that we will lose our free will because here krishna is saying that if you if you engage if you are convinced of my opulence and mystic powers you will engage in devotional in in pure devotional service so does it mean that we don't have our free will we will lose our free will no because free will free will is something that we always have irrespective of whether we are in the material world or in the spiritual world so how to understand this it means that it is only natural that after knowing krishna's opulences we will surrender unto him alternatives are there so there will always be alternatives and there we will always have our free will which alternative we want to choose from but all these other alternatives will be there but they will lose their appeal they will lose their appeal because now krishna has given us the best when you have the best why will you settle for the next best no if somebody is giving you okay you have here 100 dollars and here you have 10 dollars choose one it's only natural that you will choose 100 dollars so when you have the best why will you settle for the next best so when you know of krishna's opulences it's only natural that one will engage in pure devotional service so this is the conclusion of the first section krishna is the forefather of all the forefathers and all the demigods in administration next uh, section we will see the chatushloki gita chatushloki gita the whole bhagavad gita can be summarized in these four verses 10.8 to 10.11 so this is called as the chatushloki gita the four verses this we will see in the next class if krishna so sanctions shila prabhupada ki jai shrimad bhagavad gita ki jai mata ji can i ask you a question about the notes that you have those notes from um, chapter 1 to the last chapter of the bhagavad gita um uh -huh. can they be, can they be shared with another person if they want to give class can they use your no, uh, not notes but these uh, these slides that you're sharing yes it can be used no problem thank you thank you hari krishna hari krishna do we have any questions so we have uh, kamla bambani who is joining us for the first time from peru thank you very much for joining always a pleasure to have uh, more people attending i have a question too that do you have any hindi uh, lectures also in the sessions yeah uh, uh, there are other devotees who give uh, hindi classes and i will share it with you uh, as soon as i i have asked one devotee in india and he said that he will get back to me on this so if anybody was currently doing a hindi systematic bhagavad gita class i will share it with you but i don't give classes in hindi okay okay thank you thank you no thank i you. understand english but like you know that uh, most uh, i get like that the rust you call that is i, yes. I get it yes yes that's true Hin yes hindi is a very sweet language but yeah. it is my misfortune that i am not able to give a class in hindi so yeah i understand perfectly what you say so as soon as i have any, any information i will share it to you mata ji from where do you are i hmm. am originally from india uh, but i am residing in chile for the past 20 years and chile in santiago yes santiago um, came to know from santiago your contact yes okay. yeah varsha told me that she gave me your contact yeah okay thank, thank you so you. much thank you Look, for my problem, my problem you know what is my, i do uh, in the morning my 16 rounds and then i start my thakur puja uh, wow. so like uh, i am always busy by 9 o'clock so at least 9:30 quarter to 10 i am free so the half the session is already gone away it's not yeah. that i i get up early for 4:30 but okay. to like uh, that is my main problem also okay so Because what uh, one solution i can give you is you can uh, whatever you're missing the first half an hour or so you can watch the recording and the rest of the session you can join us live okay thank you so much ma'am thank Then you hari krishna hari krishna hari krishna anything else we need to discuss Um, Hare Krishna, Sanam. Hare Krishna. Uh, you said that uh, instead of uh, spending the money we earn on the people in hospitals, like giving charity to the people, sick people, it's better to give charity to the temples. So if you said it's um, because the body will last only this life long, this lifetime, right? So, yes. But if the body 
if if you don't if you don't help the person in this lifetime if the body of the person is not good or not healthy how will he or she um take or chant god's name if you okay, don't help okay so yeah i understand so the point is we we didn't say that give only to the temples you can donate to brahmanas vaishnavas devotees so if somebody is unhealthy and is not able to chant you said he cannot chant if he doesn't have a healthy body so if he is chanting then of course he is a devotee so then of course you can donate to that person and what if the person is not a devotee if you if you help if you help that person and try to make him a devotee then yeah if the person is not a devotee and you try to make him a devotee you somehow make sure that he becomes a devotee because if he doesn't become a devotee and you have helped the person but he is using the charity for sinful activities then you are going to take the karma suppose if he doesn't spend for uh, sinful activities but he's uh, he's living a healthy life he's and but he does not chant then so if he is not using for devotional activities he is only using it for his own personal sense gratification even if it is not sinful if it is for his own personal sense gratification it is still sinful it is not a devotional activity also oh, you let him die that means i'm just like uh... no no why no no why will you let him die if you have a choice it to <laughs> if you have a choice see when you have a choice you want to choose the best so the best option is to give charity to the devotees to vaishnavas to brahmanas in the temple where the money is going to be used for the service of krishna now let's say a person is not a devotee and he is in the hospital right and you you sponsor his treatment and now he is healthy and he's come back to his daily activities but now for the rest of the life that he is going to live he is going to again only use his uh, the rest of the life in personal sense gratification so you have only increased his miseries because if he has lived for 60 years and now he is living for five more years extra previously for 60 years the karmic reaction he would have take but now he has to take for five extra years the karmic reaction for living his life for his own personal sense gratification so you have increased his miseries and you have increased also your miseries so that is not intelligence okay 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 thank you hari krishna hari krishna Hare Krishna, Mother Ji, can I ask you one question? Yes. What about people that, like you just said, um, like okay, like we have teachers and we have um, students, like um, tutors and stuff like that, and like you, maybe they are from a different religion, and they eat meat and so forth, and you are paying them for their services. Then do you also get karmic reaction? No, because there you are paying for services. It's not a charity. it's paying for services that is different here we are talking about charity there you don't have a choice you have to pay for the services of course but then they use that money for me reading and so forth. that's okay but you are paying for services no you are not giving it in charity when you give in charity you have a choice but for services you don't have a choice right you have to pay for the services okay, but if okay. you have a choice if you have the choice let's say there is a vaishnava tutor and there is a non vaishnava tutor it's always better if you have the choice then it's always better to hire a vaishnava tutor because also by associating with a vaishnava tutor you benefit but if there is no choice for example when you when you, even when you pay your taxes you your taxes go to the government and probably the government is sponsoring a slot a house so but you have to pay your taxes so no here we are talking about charity where you have a choice Oh, okay so then like you said the government is using for slot rows we don't get the karmic reaction no right? because you are doing your duty now there you are doing your prescribed duty here the talk is about charity which okay. is voluntary mata ji can i yes, yes. Uh, here like uh, there are many poor people poor families and they really don't have uh, nothing to eat sometimes so like what we do uh, we collect our money or food stuff and here are like sai organization organization they they have that seva dars and they go do do go and give like one bag of uh, like food stuff and like like that they go and distribute with distribute with their own hands so we do that but they are peruans they eat non veg and all but they really need to eat something like food stuff so is it okay yeah so as long as what you are distributing is prasad 
then it is okay. If you are distributing that which is not prasad, which is not offered to the Lord, then it is a sinful activity. So okay. you, you prepare the food, you offer it to the Lord and you distribute prasad. Then oh, it is stuff like uh, like raw material no? raw, raw rice and everything does yeah and yeah but that raw material they are going to cook with meat only no maybe yeah, yeah so it's not recommended according to the shastra you can if you feel that they are hungry they really need to eat as you said you can make the food and distribute prasad but when you give raw material they are going to cook it with meat and you will take the karmic reaction Oh, that way. Yes. Okay. We'll discuss this about uh, in our group. Thank okay. you, Mother. Thank, Thank you. Mother, can I ask you one more question? Yes. It is now, like you said, that uh, they, if we give raw material, so there are times like uh, given raw material from, you know, outside a grocery shop, they have signs that we are hungry or we don't have money. But I, in my heart, I say, okay, I donate this first to Krishna or Shri Prabhupada and then donate. So then if they're using it for like cooking with meat and all that, I still get the karmic reaction? No. How do you, in your mind, you're saying you're donating to Prabhupada, but are you are you going to give Prabhupada raw rice to eat, kacha chawal, uncooked? No. Yeah. No. So then it has so to be cooked is... food, cooked food that you offer, that you can give to Prabhupada to eat. Then it is prasad. Then it is remnants of Prabhupada. Then you can give them. So that means... As many times I, I have donated that way, I will get karmic reaction if that's food used in with meat and all that, right? Yes, yes. Oh, man. Okay. okay. Thank you. You're welcome. But we can donate uh, raw materials to the temple, right? That's not a problem. Knowing that... Yeah, going... because, yeah, if the temple is cooking prasad, now there are so many temples. There are also temples where meat is served. There are temples where alcohol is served. Where tem temples where the food is never offered, there are temples where they are cooking with onion and garlic. If the temple is cooking prasad, they are actually offering the food to the Lord. It is sattvic, they are offering to the Lord. Then yes, then you can donate to the temple, no problem. Okay. Nowadays, there are temples of even politicians, there are temples of film stars. So just temple, no. What kind of a temple is it? Is it a bona fide temple where they are offering the food to the Lord? It's without onion garlic. It's without meat. It is without, um, it's not the food in the mode of passion and ignorance. The food is actually offered. Then yes, you can offer. Because there are many organizations where they collect food, they cook and they distribute, but they never offer it to the Lord. They just distribute like that. So that is not prasad. It, food can be prasad only when it is offered to the Lord in the proper way. Only then it is prasad. Just because there is a distribution of food after a spiritual program, it does not mean that it is prasad. Okay? Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Matani, what about the food that's cooking in Gurdwara? When? Do they offer it? I don't know. I don't know. It depends on whether it is offered. Because they, they don't do believe offer. in the food. They don't believe in the form of God, right? They they believe in their gurus, like Guru Nanak Sahib and the gurus they have. So, what do bandara lagta hai? People eat in the gurdwara. Is that wrong to eat that? I I don't know no. the internals. I don't know the details. But the the bottom line is this: if the food is actually offered and if it is sattvic, then yes, it is prasad. But then how will I know? Because I've never seen a picture of any god in gurdwara. You have to inquire. Uh, excuse me. What I know that they do the ardas before doing the lag langar. Yes, so doing... they offer. Okay, yeah. so if they offer, if it, they if they offer, it is prasad. It's as simple as that. Yeah. Okay. But but not necessarily that your food is going to be without garlic and onion. So when the food is without onion and garlic, it is unfit for offering to the Lord. The Lord does not accept food with onion and garlic. The it's other uh, they don't they don't use that. Okay, so food that is in the mode of passion and ignorance is unfit for offering, and it is not accepted by the Lord. In no prasad, you can use onion and garlic. Okay, so Lal has written the chat that he has a question. It's the same thing. Good morning. Why? 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 What is it? What is? 
Yeah, what so, is the problem with onion and garlic? Is that your question? Yeah. Why? Why is it? it it's not vegetarian. It's naturally grown. Why? What is wrong in it? Okay. So this is a whole two-hour class. <laughs> okay, but I will condense it. Say onion and garlic are foods in the mode of passion. And food that is in the mode of passion ignites or agitates your senses. And foods that ignite and agitate your senses are not good for your sadhana. So people who have a lot of onion and garlic, their mind is so agitated, they indulge more and more um, sexually and other illicit activities. So therefore, these foods are not uh, accepted in the Vaishnava tradition. In Sanatan Dharma, onion and garlic. See, before the Britishers came to India, nobody in the whole country was consuming onion garlic, nor were they consuming tea and coffee. It was something that is not acceptable for human consumption at all. It is only the Britishers that they changed the system in India because it suited them. Bringing in tea was a good profit for the Britishers and therefore uh, in India they started to consume. But if you see in Vedic tradition, they do not consume because in the it's in the, it's in the um, uh, mode of passion. What we offer to the Lord are first class ingredients. First class ingredients is sattvic food. Onion and garlic is not sattvic. And that which is second class and third class, we cannot offer to the Lord. We offer to the Lord that which is first class. So this is one part of the story. Second part is it is not good for your health also. If you see scientifically, even on the material platform, it is not good for your health. See, when you eat onion and garlic, the mouth is stinking. We cut the onions, there are tears flowing from the eyes. So even naturally, you can see that it is not good for you at the physical level. They have, see, if people say that garlic has many health benefits, it is a, it's a very good medicine for blood pressure. But the point is, if you take a medicine and you are not suffering from a disease, the medicine will have an adverse effect on your health. You take a medicine only if you are in a diseased condition, isn't it? So if you are taking something that is a very potent medicine, but you don't have that disease, it is only going to have an adverse reaction on your body. So scientifically, it's not good for your health. If you just Google onion and garlic, why? I will actually, now what I will do is I will but share. This, but all this thing, I do agree, but is it scientifically proven? Yes, it is scientifically proven that they do more harm. They they have some benefits, no doubt, but they do more harm than good in your body, it, at the physical as well as at the mental level. I will share a whole document on this now, actually, at the end yeah, of the class. That would be nice because you might be there. This is not just in food, but there might be so many other components like medicines and all the things that can be made through a, a garlic, especially, or, or even onion. So... If a doctor gives you a prescription which is having this origin, like for, for instance, in, in India, the the homopathics and all that thing, I don't know what type of ingredients they use. I've never tried it, but I suppose so they might be having these type of, uh, uh, I mean, all this, you know. Yeah, I understand. So the point is, if you have a medical condition and there is no cure for it other than the medicine that has contain, contains onion and garlic, then you are allowed to take because now you have a medical condition and it's a, it's a question of life and death. And you yeah. need to live in order to engage in devotional service. But the point is eating onion and garlic on a daily basis. If you are eating onion and garlic, it means you cannot offer the food to the Lord. Okay. And it means you are eating food that is not prasad. So it means you're eating only sin. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, that which is not offered to me, when you consume that which is not offered, you are eating only sin. So irrespective of whether the food is vegetarian or vegan or if it's just one apple, if you are eating without offering, you are eating only sin. That, that we have to always remember. Whenever you eat, what is it that you are eating? Just imagine you are eating sin. Hmm? So the point is, I want to eat prasad. So if I want to eat prasad, I should have that which the Lord will accept. So the Lord will accept only sattvic food. The first class ingredients the devotee wants to offer, isn't it? So therefore, we cannot consume onion. The point is we are not vegetarians or vegans. We are prasadarians. We are prasadarians. Prasadarians means I will eat that which I can offer to Krishna. Onion and garlic, I cannot offer to Krishna. So therefore, I will not eat. If Krishna was to eat chicken, no problem. The devotee will eat chicken. No problem. But the point is Krishna will not accept it. 
Therefore, the devotee does not act. The servant does that which the master does. The servant follows the master. So if, if Krishna does not eat, we do not eat. That is the bottom line. That's the that's the that's how you can summarize. But there are so many other explanations, and I will share that in the WhatsApp group because yeah, this because is a burning question. Many people ask this question. It's a no, burning. No, no, I'm I'm very curious about that. In fact, you know, there was somebody who I don't know who was it here right now in the group and asked the same question regarding the gurdwara. I don't know. Somebody just asked a question over there, but who he or she who asked was the right thing because in the gurdwara it's it's normal. I was in Panama seven months before and I asked Babaji the same question. I'm sure somebody who might be in the group was in Panama and I asked Babaji the same question. Onion, garlic, idol worship, fasting, so many things I asked him the same question over there. It's, it's the same thing. Why? 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 Why I cannot have a free path like going but why why am I have to restrict myself as a human being to reach to God? So this is the I mean, I want to go to God, but why I need to? Of course, okay, I understand. I'm not going to like kill a living source like what is an animal or anything, and no problem. I do agree with that, okay. But when it comes to fasting, when it comes to onion, garlic, it it becomes like too, too, too more and more. You understand me? Yeah, I understand. So, and I, Babaji told me over there in St. Mat, it's nothing over there. I go to Canada with, to see the children. I go to the Gurdwara and uh, it's the same thing. You know, that like they they use onion, garlic and there are people who donate onion, garlic in the Gurdwara. Okay. So so this these questions, you know, uh, one, one needs to know and I'm very curious to know about all these things. So the point that you need to remember here, Lal, is what is it that you what is it that you want? Now you say that you want to go back to Godhead. Now what kind of a time frame are you looking at? Are you looking at I want to go back home, back to Godhead in this lifetime, or you are ready to wait for some more millions of lifetimes? So as I said, there are different preachers who preach according to time, place, and circumstances. Now, in some parts, the sacrifice is more, the surrender is more. In some parts, the surrender is less. Now, when the, and Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that as you surrender unto me, I will reward accordingly. So, Krishna reciprocates according to one's level of surrender. When you surrender fully, which is our Sanatan Dharma, no onion, no garlic, only eating Krishna Prasad and other things as well. Okay. So when you surrender fully, then you are closer to going back home, back to Godhead. You can go back home, back to Godhead at the end of this lifetime itself. If you strictly follow the four regulative principles and you chant your rounds, 16 rounds. Now, if you are not able to surrender fully and you are still, uh, if you are unable to give up, say some, anything, onion, garlic, tea, coffee, whatever it is, if you are unable to surrender, then Krishna will reciprocate in that proportion. So it means you have to wait to go back home, back to God for a few more million lifetimes. And that is a very, ris at least for me, it is a very risky proportion. When I took the decision to join ISKCON, see, I was, I, I was not raised in the, in this, uh, in this path. I, I, I took a decision after I analyzed different paths, the pros and cons, and then I took a decision. So then I, I told myself that giving up onion, garlic, tea, coffee is a very small, minuscule, insignificant price to pay to go back home, back to Godhead in this lifetime. I mean, how many years do I have left? How many years do we have left? So cannot we sacrifice the next 20, 30, 40 years just giving up onion, garlic, tea, coffee? I mean, just think about it. No, it's such a small price to pay. But what are you getting in return? You're going back home, back to Godhead in this lifetime. But if I if I leave that and I wait for now next lifetime, I don't know. I may be born in an animal body or a plant body. And again, I have to go through 8 million, 400,000 million bodies before I get a human body. So that for me personally, I said, no, it's a very risky proportion proposition. I prefer to sacrifice the next 20, 30 years of my life. Yeah, and I think it's a very small price to pay. So you have to see what you want and what kind of a time frame you are looking at. So this is for you. This Nobody can force you. I mean, if we all have our free will, right? So you decide for yourself what kind of time frame are you looking at and the price you pay 
and compared to what you are getting in return, is it worth it or it's not worth it? That is for you to decide. <laughs> And why restrictions? No, you say why restrictions as a human being? See, restrictions are there even on the material platform. Even on the material, when you're driving, you have to stop at the red light. You have a certain speed limit, isn't it? You cannot do what you want. So restrictions are there even on the material platform when you're driving on the road. So imagine there are no restrictions. Everyone does whatever they want to. No, nobody stops at any traffic signal. They can go at any speed. There is going to be chaos. So there are restrictions in the human society, even at the material platform. So more so on the spiritual platform. Yeah, because for me, the red light is not eating me. Anyway, not to go along, I don't want to take more time, you know, but like, like you are right on your, I mean, I respect what you say and all that thing, but just wanted to really, I was curious about that, that even vegetarian food can comes to, it comes to like that. I understand non-drinking, no alcohol, no smoking, not eating meat. I do understand all these things. But coming to very extreme, this thing is that, that that's the thing I wanted to know more about. That. The thing is yeah, that's extreme for, see, I, I also used to have onion garlic and there was a time when I didn't know how, to, I didn't know how to cook without onion garlic. So I have gone through that stage. But I can tell you from personal, ex and I'm not saying this because I want to promote what I'm preaching. I mean, I can say from personal experience that when I gave up onion and garlic, I can see the difference in my in my body, my health, my mind feels much more happy and better after I gave up onion and garlic. Because once it's flushed out of your system, the the the, the rajoguna and the tamoguna, no, those foods, the foods that are in the mode of passion ignorance, once it that is flushed out of your system, you feel so much better. Your mind feels so much better. You feel happier. So I can say this from personal experience that it has done me a lot of good. And I'm very glad that I actually gave it up. So this is something that you personally need to do let's say uh do an experiment you have to do the experiment yourself to see the results so if you give up for one month strictly you can see the results for yourself i'll try to give a try <laughs> yeah because unless you don't do it yourself you will not you will not i mean i can uh, describe in so many ways but the personal experience like you know you can you will know it for yourself that's that's a whole different thing Thank you very much. I won't take more time. Hare Krishna. Okay, Shivani, you have your hand raised. Yeah, Mataji, you just said that uh, if you, um, we stand 16 rounds and follow mm -hmm. principles, we can go back to God and this, in this life. Right? But doesn't Another it, instruction of a bona fide spiritual master. Yeah, but doesn't yes. it also, don't we take in regards that time of death, what our consciousness is, if our consciousness is not that, even though we have practiced all our life, we won't go back, right? See, Shivani, if you are for chanting 16 rounds and following the four regulatory principles, you are following under the bon under the instruction of a bona fide spiritual master, you are doing that which your guru asks you to do. So when there is initiation and you are keeping your part of the deal, you no, know, you have vowed to the guru that I will follow the 16 rounds and four principles, you are keeping your part of the deal. Your guru Maharaj will take you back home, back to God. He will keep his part of the deal. You keep your part of the deal, he will keep his part of the deal. So even if we are lacking... Even if we forget, the Guru and the Lord, they will complete whatever you are lacking. Krishna says, no, I carry what you lack and preserve what you have. So even if we are lacking or even if we forget, but because we keep our part of the deal, we, we fulfill our promise to the Guru, whatever we are lacking will be completed by Guru and Krishna. Don't worry about that. And then if you don't have a bona fide Guru, but you are connected to Krishna consciousness and you're doing the 16 rounds and the four regular principles, then there's no way you go back, right? You won't go back in this life. Yeah, so a lot depends on what is the reason that you don't have a guru. What is the reason? Now you can say that the family uh, situation is such or whatever, it, but the point is if you desire it from the core of your heart, Krishna will definitely sanction it for you. No matter what the hindrances may be, no matter what the restrictions may be, but Krishna will sanction the sincere desire of his or her devotee. So if you sincere it, if you sincerely desire it, no, if that is the only prayer that you have, Krishna will definitely fulfill your desire. Definitely. There is no doubt. Thank you, Mataji. Thank you, Hare Krishna. You're welcome. Yeah, Sri Radhe Hari, you have your hand raised. Uh, what is if someone doesn't leave onions and garlic and um, 
and then they but they are doing hari naam sankirtan even then they cannot go back to godhead if somebody is eating onion garlic and doing hari naam sankirtan and doing their regular trips uh, japa every day and then yeah so obviously that person has not uh, surrendered to a guru because a guru is going to tell you to give up onion and garlic right so no, he has surrendered to guru and krishna they have anish they have gotten initiated but they are still doing hari naam sankirtan they are doing japa but they are not leaving hari uh, what do you call onion and garlic so if they are initiated and they continue to eat onion and garlic is then they are disobeying the orders of the spiritual master and that is guru aparad acha it is a more serious crime because yeah. now see eating onion garlic before initiation and eating onion garlic after initiation it's a before it is a papa now it is aparad because now you are disobeying the order of the spiritual master you are breaking the promise that you gave to your spiritual master so now it is a more serious crime okay so but if they are on the run and they always have to eat in restaurants and they are there is no excuse there is no excuse you have to rush you have to eat or you always can take food from home okay thank you hari krishna mata ji thank you Hare Krishna. Mata ji, is there any way to nullify the apra? Uh, the you said the it becomes an apra, right? You just said apra, or yeah, Vaishnava apra can be nullified by asking forgiveness from the Vaishnava. You have offended Guru apra can be nullified by asking forgiveness to the Guru, and then you depend on the mercy of Guru and Krishna. So, if a Guru is not present in the world, then what happens? Oh, guru may not be physically present, but you can always pray to your uh, guru on the altar and ask for forgiveness. Okay, thank you. Madam. Yeah, and this this person is saying that uh, the uh, the all the prayers can be um, nullified by just chanting Hari Krishna Maha Mantra. You don't stop; you just continue to chant, and and they'll be nullified. So when, you this, mean, when you say this, when you say this person, do you have a shastri quote? No, no, I don't have shastri. This person is. no this person is a devotee from like i don't know 197 19 when prabhupad was alive you know like okay he, i would like to see shastrik evidence okay okay no it, okay i'll i'll ask i'll ask the person what to do okay, okay. hari krishna hari krishna anything else yes sanam i have one more question okay uh, you just said that um, uh before the british people arrived in india the onion garlic tea coffee did not exist right i mean it existed but people were not consuming ha ah, okay and uh, is it true that during mahabharat when uh, the pandavas had to go through the the 13 years exile remember they arjun had to not yeah arjun had to become a cook yes and he cooked uh, a dish with onion is it true i have never heard of it do you have any evidence shastra ke evidence is there is there in the mahabharat i have seen it in the serial the mahabharat serial no serials are something that they make to suit the audience so we cannot uh, we, uh, serials and uh, movies are not uh, bona fide authority unless you read from the shastra then only you can accept it as authority so that part and uh, in that uh, arjun was cooking i don't remember for whom and uh, he's cooking a dish with onion so i was like how can arjun cook no you cannot rely on serials and movies you cannot rely so that time onion existed 5000 years ago yeah it may have existed but definitely it was not consumed okay it was not fit it was not considered fit for consumption just like few years back you can say that dog meat was considered unfit for human consumption but now human beings are even consuming dog meat so every time the kali yuga advances it is getting more and more degraded okay so 5000 years back onion and garlic was not considered to be fit for consumption okay thank you so much you're welcome anything else we need to discuss mantra ji one more question yes. i had somebody who is arguing with me he was a shy wife that uh, the lord um, lord ram used to eat meat yeah so shila prabhupad was said the same thing somebody asked shila prabhupad that lord ram ate meat so shila prabhupad said lord ram can eat meat he can eat you he can eat me he can eat the whole world he is a supreme personality <laughs> of god okay so first answer is that that which god can do we cannot do okay lord shiva drank poison can we drink poison no no 
so we should not imitate them we should only follow their instructions that is the first point and second point is there is no shastric evidence that lord ram ate meat but even if he did it doesn't matter okay 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 thank you hari krishna hari krishna anything else all right then see you all next week if krishna so sanctions thank you all very much um, for your assistance vancha kalpa taru vyascha kripa sindhu vyay vacha patita nam pavane bhyo vaishnave bhyo namo namaha shila prabhupada ki jai shri bhagavati ki jai 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 hari krishna hari mata ji ki jai thank you mata ji hari krishna ram pranam hari krishna sanam thank you hari krishna hari krishna thank you Hare Krishna.